My name is Debbie and I'm the Executive Director of Americans for Safe Access. The mission of Americans for Safe Access is to ensure safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. ASA works with our grassroots base of over 100,000 members and supporters from all across the country and our professional advisory group to effect change through public education, support services, professional development, research, litigation, and direct advocacy at this local, state, and federal level. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our Veterans and Medical Cannabis Roundtable discussion. I first want to thank our partner organizations at Veteran Initiative 22, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access, Mission Zero, Texoma, Veteran Alliance, and Harvest 360. And I also want to thank all the presenters who are joining us today um, who have been working with us for the past few weeks to help plan this event. I want to give a big thank you to our sponsors at WeMax and Ease, uh, two great companies who really support ASA and veteran issues. We encourage you to please uh, visit their websites and support their work. The discussion today will include an hour of panel presentations followed by 40 minutes of Q&A. All the presenters will be on during the Q&A portion and our moderator, Abby Bennett, will be moderating that portion to help get all of your questions answered. We really want to encourage everyone to get involved in the Q&A discussion, so please feel free to send your questions anytime during the presentations. Uh, you can use the chat field over on the right of your screen, or there is, if you want to um, ask a question anonymously, there is also a button at the bottom um, that uh, says Q&A where you can also use to submit a question. Um, in between a few of the panels, we will also be showing a few patient testimonials, so please be sure to watch those. Um, if you miss any of the program today, we will be posting this webinar on our website at safeaccessnow.org slash ASA underscore live so that you can watch anything you missed or that others who were not able to make it today will be able to watch. If you enjoy this webinar or appreciate any of the work that we do here at ASA, please consider becoming a member. We really cannot do any of our work without the support of our members. Um, and we have a veteran discount, so membership is only $25 a year. Uh, you can sign up at safeaccessnow.org slash member. We will also be posting a blog tomorrow on um, congressional action for veteran medical cannabis patients. So please keep an eye out for that tomorrow. Uh, now let's get started with the program. To begin with, uh, we will have an intro on the state of current affairs regarding veteran access. And we are honored to have Michael Krawitz here to present this information for us. Take it away, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Krowitz. I'm uh, Executive Director of Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, Debbie, and thanks so much for having us today. Uh, all the veterans here today invited by Americans for Safe Access uh, to participate in this, in this program. Um, I am the Executive Director of Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access. I served in the United States Air Force back in the 1980s, came injured and uh, for many years worked inside the uh, cannabis movement as an activist in, in my retirement. Um, I was actually very privileged and honored to be the veteran that uh, was in the position to negotiate the first ever Veterans Affairs, uh, Veteran Hospital System, medical cannabis policy. It's the only uh, cannabis policy in the VA system. Uh, we call it and just refer to it as the VA uh, marijuana policy. Uh, that policy was passed in back in 2010. It was the byproduct of a lot of work, uh, and uh, the work occurred mostly at the state level. Uh, Proposition 215 was passed back in 1996, as most people know. Uh, we studied very carefully the results of Proposition 215 and how uh, patients were using cannabis under that new state law, and we saw right away a trend 
where patients were using less of the pain medication, less pain pills, as they used cannabis as an adjunct, as a combined treatment. There was a symbiotic effect of the cannabis and the, and the opiates that reduced the amount of pain pills used. Uh, that set me in motion working inside the VA for many years to try to create policy that would allow for veterans to use cannabis. Uh, if you talk to VA officials back then in the 1980s or early 1990s, uh, into all the way to 2010 when we got this VA policy, they would just shut you down. They just say, well, I'm working for the United States federal government. Marijuana is illegal. We can't talk about it. But they can't talk about it now. We opened up the dialogue, and, and the dialogue has been uh, quite amazing since 2010. Um, the policy was passed in 2010. It was updated in 2011 and again in 2017. It's three parts. Very quickly, uh, the first part is basically what I've been talking about, what cleared the way for veterans to feel comfortable using cannabis as a medicine. Uh, it clearly says that you are able to use cannabis under state medical cannabis access programs and not have that in, you know, adversely affect you when you come back uh, to the VA hospital for the rest of your care. And our goal uh, has always been, and I think we work together with the VA, VA on this, to integrate this treatment and to get the best result for the veterans that we can with all the medications and all the treatments available, in, including cannabis. The second part of the policy was pretty straightforward. VA pol uh, property is federal property. It, you can't come on federal property with uh, federally illegal drug substances and make yourself known to the police. Uh, that would uh, result in arrest, and there's no protection under the policy that they can provide to you from that arrest. That's really been a problem, but yet again, we've really never seen uh, that many veterans running afoul of that. Although the policy at uh, nursing homes, veterans homes, and, and a lot of other areas of concern because of that uh, status. And then the last one, of course, was the one that we worked on the most, and that is the uh, doctors at the VA were told by this policy that they cannot fill out the forms or otherwise uh, recommend cannabis under state medical cannabis access programs. It's important to note that the recommending of cannabis is an alternative to the prescription. The prescription authority is controlled by the DEA. And again, you get into that federal area where there's no protection, but the recommendation as was shown in a court case out, out West years ago, the Conant versus McCaffrey later, uh, Conant uh, versus, uh, uh, versus, uh, uh, McCaffrey, oh, what's a new drug? Sorry, I can't remember that. Uh, anyway, the Conan versus McCaffrey case showed that that this was free speech, that this was in fact part of the necessary free speech of the doctor-patient relationship, which immediately uh, led us to say, well, do doctors at the VA have free speech? Uh, generally in this regard, no. Federal government employees, just like active duty military have limits on their free speech. Um, and in this regard, the, the VA has made a, a demand that they not fill out these forms, even though it's necessary free speech for that doctor-patient relationship. Uh, and that's created a lot of different issues. Uh, it's created a lot of, e of efforts by Congress to change that and give that authority to the doctors at the VA to recommend that cannabis. Uh, and it's also forced veterans to go out of the VA and go into the state and seek alternative medical care, duplicating a lot of the services that they're already getting inside the VA. Um, the Veterans Affairs policy is very clear. Uh, doctors that uh, were, you know, would tell you that you have somehow violated a drug test um, and that you are having your pain treatment taken away as punishment because you're using cannabis, uh, it, it, they are not following the VA policy if they do that. And that does occur, but it's on a case by case basis. The VA knows the policy and at the top level, they get it, they understand and they're following it. So I think that's a, a good primer to kind of get you started. Um, I'm not sure if we've got Todd Larkin on the line here. He can come in with the next uh, step in this in this briefing. And see and hear me now. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Abby Bennett. I am a journalist for Connecting Vets and CBS Radio. Um, I cover Veterans Affairs, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and also veterans issues on Capitol Hill. And of course, that includes cannabis access. Um, so today we are going to have a couple of different panels and, and a Q&A session, as Debbie mentioned. Um, and I want to thank Asa for having me, of course. Um, so we're going to start today off with a panel on reducing barriers to access. Um, and on this panel, we have Matt Zorn, associate with 
uh, Yetter Coleman LLP focused on complex commercial litigation. Um, we have Todd Scantini, who is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, a West Point graduate, and CEO of Harvest 360, which is focused on setting conditions for medical cannabis research. And we also have uh, Navy vet veteran Eric Stamper, who is an advocate for safe and affordable cannabis access and veterans' rights and owner of the Maryland Hemp Exchange. Um, we are actually going to start with Matt today. So, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Zorn. I'm an associate at uh, Yetter Coleman uh, Litigation Boutique in Houston. Um, I represent uh, Dr. Suzanne Sisley in various litigations against uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. And our goal in all of these litigations is to try to improve uh, research access to medicinal cannabis, specifically uh, the cannabis that people around the country are using. Um, there's a problem in this country right now where uh, our research scientists are not able to do clinical trials or rigorous research with the cannabis that people are actually using. Um, instead, the cannabis that researchers are required to use by virtue of, a, of what I would call a regulatory thicket is exclusively grown in the University of Mississippi. And, and this has been well documented in the press, but this, this cannabis is subpar. It has sticks and seeds, and it's just not like cannabis that uh, veterans and, and all, all sorts of uh, Americans who rely on cannabis for medical treatment are using. Um, so we have filed three lawsuits now, and we're on our third lawsuit. And I, I would just like quickly like to go through those lawsuits and then maybe just kind of share some thoughts as to where I see this going. You know, there's going to be a change in administration and I, I just want to offer some thoughts on to where, where this can, can be taken. So um, the first lawsuit that we filed on behalf of Dr. Sisley and Scottsdale Research Institute, we filed uh, in 2019 um, because the Trump administration was not processing applications to uh, cultivate marijuana or cannabis for research. There was a program that was started in 2016, which was to allow more people to have a competition for the type of cannabis that would be available for research. And the Department of Justice just decided to do nothing. Um, they, interestingly, they didn't shut down the program. They didn't move forward with the program. They just did nothing. Um, which is, as a lawyer, is, is actually quite difficult because you can't, you can go to court when someone denies your application, you can go to court, well, you wouldn't go to court if they approved your application, but you can't go to court when someone takes your application and puts it in a vault and then does nothing with it. So we filed an action in the DC circuit, to, which is, a, some people call it the second highest court in the country, just to get the DEA to process our application. And what ended up happening was is DEA processed our application, processed all the applications, and then said that they were moving forward with the entire program. That was in August, summer of 2019, but DEA didn't do much of anything until March of 2020. The DEA created this brand new regulatory framework for research cannabis. And, and interestingly, in, in doing that, they, the DEA kept on saying, well, we had to do this. We had no choice. Now, I don't have enough time to go through in detail, but this plan involves turning DEA into a clearinghouse for, for research cannabis. So all research cannabis that would be grown in the country would first go to DEA and then distribute it to the research. And my colleague and I were, we weren't surprised by this. We, we kind of had an inkling as to why, but what we were surprised about was DEA kind of was saying publicly, like we had no choice to do this. And then they weren't putting why they had no choice to do that. So we filed another lawsuit against DEA and we filed a complaint in the district of Arizona. And two weeks after we filed the complaint, two or three weeks after DEA came to us and said, hey, do you guys want to settle? And so we agreed on a settlement and there was a secret a memorandum from the Office of Legal Counsel, which was published, which 
by and large explains why the Trump administration never did anything with the research program. It, it's the way that the administration has interpreted a treaty called the Single Convention of Narcotics. I don't have enough time to go into it, but I would encourage everyone to, uh, if you want to know why research has been held up in this country, this is a very integral part of the roadblocks, which is that treaty obligations require a certain uh, infrastructure for our, uh, cannabis research, and we don't have that infrastructure set up. That, that, that is what the Department of Justice's current position is. But um, the third lawsuit, and I think this is maybe the most important lawsuit that we filed, is a, effectively a rescheduling lawsuit. And we are asking the DEA to reconsider a petition that it denied on the basis that it is misinterpreting the Controlled Substances Act, specifically what it means to have a currently accepted medical use in the United States. Um, this is there have been a number of lawsuits filed sort of relating to the same area, but our particular lawsuit is uh, a little different in terms of it's very focused on the administrative process and administrative law and statute and, and like what does this statute mean? So it's not a constitutional case. It's kind of what does the Controlled Substances Act mean? And I think what everyone here would be interested in is like if we succeed, you know, the hope is that cannabis would be moved to a schedule three or lower um, that would do for for us that would allow this this research blockade to open up um, because a lot of the current uh, obstacles in research has to do with cannabis being in schedule one or two um, schedule three would kind of remove all of those barriers but then of course in schedule three that would also kind of open up the idea of medicinal cannabis whether uh, you know, it wouldn't be FDA approved, but it would certainly, you might be able to not, you wouldn't, you know, we heard Michael earlier talk about you can't walk on federal, you know, lands with cannabis and there, there might be room to sort of carve out things because there would be a recognized medical use. So um, that is in a nutshell what I am doing with Dr. Sisley. And, you know, it has been an honor of my lifetime. I am only 33 years old, but it's been an honor to be on the front lines of this. And um, it's exciting, it's difficult, but it's totally worth it. And the reason, I am, you know, my colleague and I were doing this pro bono and, and the reason we're doing it is um, for people, you know, the members of this organization because, and, and other organizations like it, it's, um, it is really important that people who are relying on medicinal cannabis to be able to have access to it um, free of federal interference. And the first step in that is actually even being able to research it. So um, I, I think my time is up. Um, just one quick note about looking ahead. Um, you know, we've got a new administration coming in. So we're, we're very hopeful that uh, there's going to be more maybe more of a dialogue than there was and maybe we won't have to file any more lawsuits so thank you everyone hey guys uh i think i'm on all yeah. right um thanks very much all right uh, my name is todd scatini uh i'm a retired army lieutenant colonel i served the army for 27 years and uh, it was uh, the honor and the privilege of my life. I, I want to say thank you very much to Americans for Safe Access for uh, providing us with this platform to have this incredibly important conversation, a prescient conversation uh, about veterans and medical cannabis. I also want to say um, hello and happy Veterans Day to any veteran out there uh, watching this today uh, and, and anyone who loves a veteran. So thank you all for your service. And it was an uh, honor and a privilege to serve alongside you, uh, be led by many of you and to lead many of you. So um, today's a very special day for us. Uh, today, we find ourselves uh, on, at an inflection point in history, really. Uh, you know, when we have a, a global pandemic taking place, uh, ironically, 100 years after our last global pandemic that, that was really started and spread after World War I, 
Um, we're, we have massive social unrest. And, and we as veterans find ourselves in the middle of a, a massive health crisis that is marked by uh, increased levels of suicide, uh, chronic pain, uh, drug abuse and drug overdose, um, traumatic brain injury at a much higher level and issues of, uh, of that nature. This, this uh, inflection point is really intersected by what was already taking place in terms of a paradigm shift Right. And this paradigm shift is really the re-legalization of cannabis and hemp. Uh, the, the fiber of this plant it literally runs through the history of our nation, uh, all the good stuff and all of the bad stuff. Um, and we have to recognize that and recognize that once we uh, prohibited the use of this plant, both in its medicinal form uh, in 1937, when it was the number two most prescribed medicine in the United States uh, and in the American pharmacopoeia, as well as an industrial plant as well that was widely produced um, uh, across our land since, since our earliest arrival. Um, this paradigm shift is really resulting in, in four major fallouts. One of them is the impact on social justice uh, the other on, on economic development, you know, we're building an industry, rebuilding an industry from the underground up and it, and it, and it takes a lot, but there are major economic impacts that are taking place from that. Um, there are sustainability impacts also taking place with that. But the one that I think is most important for us is that there are health and wellness impacts um, that we are seeing take place across the population who has access to medical cannabis today, which is well over two thirds of the population in the United States. Um, and, and I think those health and wellness impacts are being seen among the veteran community. Um, I, I firmly believe that cannabis is medicine um, and, and we can certainly show a, a significant amount of evidence for this, both anecdotal and real and, and real research driven. Um, and I think we are on the forefront of a, a, a revolution in medical affairs. Really, I mean, this is, this is a big change because now after 87 years of prohibition, we get to uh, apply the most advanced technologies to probably what is the world's most complex and therapeutically active plant. And it's, it's a real privilege to be a part of and, and, and to be able to observe it. Um, I think that the DOD has a responsibility and a duty to be on, uh, I would say, the forward leading edge of, uh, of this research that should be taking place in the United States uh, on medical cannabis. Uh, we have uh, 170 VA hospitals. We have the platform upon which to do this. We have the, the nation's largest patient population. Nine million veterans receive health care from uh, from the VA, uh, and they're a very willing population, by the way. You know, well over 90% of them have responded to to questionnaires saying that they would like access to medical cannabis as an option uh, to treat the, the ailments that come with service to the nation. Um, we have a, a huge network, uh, 170 VA hospitals, as I mentioned, uh, 1,200 clinics across the country. Each of these VA hospitals have research relationships with local universities. Um, and, and again, I mentioned that, that we have uh, a very willing population. We have skin in the game, right? We have purpose for, uh, for researching medical cannabis. And, and, you know, the DOD does care for the people that serve within it and have served within it. Uh, they care deeply about their families who are also significantly affected by this healthcare crisis that we find ourselves in today. And, and, and bottom line is we, we have the network, uh, we have the vision, we have the leadership, I believe, to do something of this nature. And, uh, and we have this moment. Uh, in order to do this, we have to reduce the barriers to research. And I asked the DOD to do that because we've been asking the DEA and the FDA for a very long time, and they get funded through the prohibition of cannabis and have no real reason to, to, um, to support this. But the DOD, on the other hand, uh, does have this. They should be walking across and, 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 and speaking out in interagency conversations 
to to uh, implore the FDA and the DEA to step back and allow the DOD to take over and ignite this network. Um, upon igniting that network, you not only have access to all of this VA uh, infrastructure, we have access to international partners. Uh, 18 or 19 NATO allies today have medical cannabis programs to include Canada that is the first G7 nation to re-legalize cannabis, uh, both for medical and for adult use. And uh, we have a significant opportunity, I think, here to do that. And, and what it really takes is leadership. And so that's what I'm asking for today from the Department of Defense is to show bold, courageous, uh, visionary leadership on this particular subject. Um, and, and I think we have the opportunity to do that with organizations like Americans for Safe Access. Uh, we have a place to do that. And, and I really look forward to being part of that conversation in the future uh, with any and all of you and, and hopefully anyone who's listening today. So uh, thanks. I'd like to pass it over to uh, a few of my panelists uh, to give some comments as well. Thank you very much. How's it going? Eric Stamper here with Veterans Initiative 22. Thank you, Debbie, and Americas for Safe Access and the great team you guys have over there taking care of uh, uh, veterans today and, and past and future. Uh, thank you for hosting this event and Abby, great for moderating and appreciate your support. Also good to have sponsors like WeMaps and Ease to support these efforts and make this information shareable and um, achievable. Um, very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about opportunities um, in research. And in that discussion, we're obviously talking about the barriers. Um, indeed, research is critical to help uh, make positive changes uh, to our federal law. I think one of the hanging fruits is, um, you know, the federal regulation and scheduling. So a lot of effort, I think, in the next year or so is going to that regard to uh, start fighting for research, making it happen. Um, I'd like to start off with a story that just last year, some of the work we're doing here in Maryland is fighting for um, you know, medical patients' rights for cannabis as well as veterans' rights. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, advocate down in Annapolis um, at the House and Senate hearings for our Second Amendment rights, our gun bills. And uh, as we were given discussion about you know, the pros and cons of gun rights and cannabis usage, one of the uh, delegates stated, there's no research on medical cannabis. How can we sit here and make decisions on something that we know nothing about? Consequently, you know, we, we, we understood and knew there's plenty and a plethora of research going on in medical cannabis. So, uh, you know, we cheered that on, we discussed even further, and uh, frankly, we sent 10 pages the next day of all the research that they could sift through to take a look at. The funny part of this uh, was ultimately we nearly passed these gun bills here in Maryland um, for, uh, almost nearly unanimous across the board. The only problem was was that scheduling of medical cannabis. But with some hard work and effort this year, uh, give us some luck. I think we might be able to pass a bill locally that we could take to a national level. Uh, so, yeah, there is quite a bit of research going on, as a matter of fact, uh, not to say nothing's happening. I think one of the big factors here is to realize that Americans feel we need our own program. We need our own research and we can't rely on trust the rest of the world and the rest of these great nations already providing research like Israel and even now Canada. So I think that's one of the heartaches now is when, and one of the agendas is to figure out how we can get our, our federal government to realize outside of the own states. So what are we doing now? Uh, you heard from, uh, 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 Matt and Todd about some of the programs right now with Dr. Sue Sisley and some of the workings at Capitol Hill and about how we're trying to do this research. Uh, here locally, we're working with some great uh, situations. Uh, uh, Mark Landis, he's a veteran and doctoral student at Kansas State University. He's currently conducting some research studies on um, medical cannabis, um, veterans, and their spouses. So there's there's some research locally right there to take a look at. And really this is uh, to help bring awareness and to develop some changes to our VA policy in regards to looking at conventional medicines versus uh, medical cannabis. So there's an IRB approval for that as well as many other programs. Uh, even more directly, we're working with organizations uh, like Vireo Health. Uh, they are a cannabis organization. They're a doctor, a physician led uh, and own and operate organization. They've got about seven business partners and organizations like the University of Minnesota, 
uh, the University of Iowa. And in fact, they've got a $3.8 million grant with the National Institute of Health, uh, talking specifically about um, chronic pain and opiate addiction problems in our um, adults. So these are some things that we're looking at. Uh, we actually engaged even more recently about suicide prevention and cannabis usage with them. So, you know, over the next course of months to a year, it looks like we'll be working with groups like that. And even locally, and, and um, Todd talked about this already, it's critical that we engage our Veterans Administration directly. Uh, we've got the VA here in Maryland, the PTSD and Suicide Prevention Team working directly with us. We're exchanging information and knowledge and, and sharing. They've come to the Cannabis Science Conference. They've got an open invitation to all of our events. That allowed me to go over across the hall to the research and development department and start having some open dialogues and discussion. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm confident to say that I think the VA is on the verge of some breakthroughs. Um, I feel that they're aware of cannabis. They understand it. They probably have done their own personal individual doctor studies. Uh, so the information literature I'm getting from the VA research and development here in Maryland is even though there's not federal funding set aside for cannabis research that they would like to gain access to, there's outside sources and funding entities that they can work directly with to start this program. And how we're gonna go about this, I hope over the next few months as we engage deeper is um, working more directly with them via ideas of like prostate health, endometriosis in women, utilizing things like CBD suppository therapy as a way to start that dialogue. So quite indeed, there's a lot of activity going on and we've got a long way to go, but I feel really the veteran population is at the forefront and cutting edge of what we're trying to, to get through. Veterans are great research projects. If you remember the atomic bomb testing, who was there? The veterans. So I feel we're, we're a long way. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Matt, Todd, and Eric. Um, next, we are going to move on to our panel um, on reducing various barriers to access. Um, and on this panel, we have Air Force veteran and nurse Sharisa Jackson. She is the chief medical executive um, of AMVETS, where she advocates for quality veteran care and leads the HEAL program to prevent veteran suicide. We also have Army veteran Jose Bellin, who is CEO of Florida Mission Zero, Inc., a nonprofit dedicated to combating PTSD and preventing veteran suicide. And we also have Eric again on this panel, um, advocate for safe and affordable cannabis access um, and veterans rights at Veterans Initiative 22 and owner of the Maryland Hemp Exchange. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me, Abby? There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharisa Jackson. I am the Chief Medical Executive of AMVETS. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so grateful and thankful to Americans for Safe Access for having me on this panel this afternoon. First and foremost, um, like she mentioned, I am a 23-year retired Air Force nurse. Uh, I am definitely a women's advocate. Um, I create different initiatives under the HEAL program with AMVETS, and I'm so grateful to be here to talk about the plight of women veterans and some of the things that um, are the barriers to access, particularly when it comes to cannabis. Um, I think first and foremost, we all need to understand and know that there are a lot of women veterans who do not recognize themselves as veterans. So before they can gain access, they need to know that they're veterans so that they can access the resources that's out here to help them. As we all know on you know, the issues that we've seen in the military community with female veterans like Vanessa Gillums. We know that a lot of female veterans suffer from military sexual trauma as well as PTSD, but we differ in our treatment and how we deal with our problems. So it's important that women veterans definitely recognize, even though the image of a veteran is a man, that they are veterans and de is deserving of the resources that's out there. So that's the first barrier I hope that we all help women veterans overcome is for them to stand up and be proud of being a woman veteran and getting the resources that they need. 
Second but foremost, um, I think it's important that women veterans recognize that they are different. However, um, they are worthy of the different um, treatment options out there. Yes, we're strong. Yes, we're brave. Yes, we were on the front lines, just like our men counterparts. But that doesn't mean we need to suffer in silence. And the best way to do that is for the community to come together as a whole and give women veterans the permission to be okay, even though they're not okay, and access options like cannabis to help them deal with their problems. Another issue I see for women veterans and um, when it comes to the barriers for accessing cannabis is the fact that women veterans just don't know. I think it's important that we educate the community. I think it's important that we educate women veterans on what options are out there. And a lot of women veterans are into the holistic approach. And that's how I see cannabis is a holistic approach to dealing with a lot of their issues and challenges. Like I mentioned earlier, PTSD, military sexual trauma. Um, we know cannabis is great for gynecological procedures and issues. So I think it's important that we definitely um, make that it available and, 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 sh and stress to women veterans this as an option. And that begins with that candid conversation, having that conversation with your primary provider at the VA, encouraging women veterans not be afraid of having that conversation with their PCP, having women veterans um, know that they can have access to um, cannabis as an option and not be afraid and be afraid of the stigma of what cannabis has out there in the community. So I think as a whole, the barriers are, are things that we can do as a community um, through education, through awareness, changing the stigma and allowing women veterans to feel like they can talk about it openly. And as a result, we can change their lives. As a result, we can give them options. As a nurse, I always try and tell my patients that if one option is not for you, there are several others out there. And so if we can break that barrier for women veterans, I believe they can see the benefit and the good in what cannabis can bring to their lives. I know for me, it's brought a change in my life as someone who's survived post-traumatic stress after being deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, twice to Iraq, once to Afghanistan, and seeing the injuries that I saw and suffering from PTSD, including insomnia, um, hypervigilance, um, and the list goes on and on and on. And it wasn't until I was introduced and I had that conversation, not in secret, secret anymore, but having that conversation to say, I've tried so many things. And we all know what being on medications for long periods of time can do. We all know what happens being on opioids and pain medications can do. So it wasn't until I was able to have an open conversation with a fellow veteran who had a medicinal card that we sat down and discussed the benefits it would have for me and it changed my life. And I, I believe that is what women veterans need out here. And the, the best way to do that is to have that open conversation and allow them to know that, they are, that there are options out here. So again, I appreciate American for Safe Access for allowing me to be here to speak on behalf of women veterans. And to all of you out there, happy pre-Veterans Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharissa. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I think we are going to take a brief pause on this barriers to access panel, um, and we are going to switch to a conversation about federal legislation with Congressman Lou Correa, um, and Dustin McDonald, ASA Policy Director, um, is going to moderate this next uh, um, panel. Dustin, take it away. Hey, can you hear me now? Yay. All right. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. All right. We're in biz. Congressman, nice to see you. Justin, good Okay, to let's see start you. again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this panel on federal legislation. Uh, we had the honor to be joined today by Congressman Lou Correa, who represents California's 46th Congressional District. Uh, Mr. Correa has a long and distinguished track record of public service that began in 1998, and he has served in the Orange County uh, Board of Supervisors, Orange County is actually where I live. Um, so thank you for your service there, uh, Mr. Correa. And he also served in the California State Legislature in the Assembly and the Senate before ascending to Congress in 2016. Uh, Mr. Correa just won his third, his third um, um, cycle in, in Congress. Uh, 
with over with nearly 70 percent of the vote. So congratulations on that. We're here today to talk with the congressman about H.R. 712, the uh, VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act. This is legislation that was approved by the House Veterans Affairs Committee in March, um, has the backing of over 105 uh, members of Congress, including a uh, bipartisan introduction and seven Republicans on the bill, as well as the chair of the House Armed Services Committee supporting the bill. This important legislation would authorize the Department of Veterans Affairs to conduct um, important research specifically on the uh, effect, the uh, medicinal effect of cannabis on treating a series of conditions that include chronic pain as well as post-traumatic stress. So huge thanks for the Congressman for all of his efforts on this legislation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Congressman to hear more about the legislation. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you very much for your support. I uh, want to say hello to all of you and thank you for uh, continuing the, the fight for good public policy at the state and federal level. I'm Congressman Lou Correa. I'm not going to declare victory yet because I wait till each and every vote is counted in my district before we say that we have won. With that being said, uh, I have to say that uh, I've worked with, I'm not a veteran, but I have worked with veterans for a number of years. I chaired the Veterans Affairs Committee in the State Senate, uh, State Assembly, and uh, have worked in the Veterans Affairs Committee in Congress as well. Uh, my quest to uh, work with veterans and cannabis policy started probably a dozen years ago when I was in the state legislature, when I would have town hall meetings invite veterans and ask them, what is it that we can do to make your life better now that you're back from serving our country? And little by little, I, keep hearing, I kept hearing an echo, uh, a message, which was uh, veterans essentially saying, we prefer cannabis to opioids to address our invisible wounds that we have brought back from the battlefield. And, and that became a chorus because the more I looked into the issue, the more I asked veterans that were essentially shy to talk about the issue, the more they said, we prefer cannabis to opioids. And of course, after looking into the issue, uh, researching it, I found that uh, the whole system was stacked against the VA prescribing, providing cannabis uh, recommendations to veterans. And, and that led me on a second quest, which was my first one being, uh, state of California and making sure that cannabis was accepted legally here. My second quest was, of course, making sure we changed law at the federal level to permit cannabis to be used not only by veterans, but uh, population as a whole. Uh, after this election today, uh, we have a bunch of new states, primarily Republican states that have uh, legalized cannabis through the initiative process. Uh, it's used one way or another. Uh, the vast, vast majority of Americans now live in state jurisdictions where cannabis is legal. Yet at the federal level, we still can't figure out how to tie our shoes, meaning that cannabis is still classified as a class one uh, drug, which means it has no medicinal purposes. All of us know that that's incorrect. Uh, our whole battle, our, our war on drugs for the last 70 years has been incorrect because it's been based on false facts, statements of policy based on politics and not a good public policy. And, and today we know that cannabis does have medicinal purposes, uh, medicinal properties. And the issue, the challenge now is how do we get the VA to make sure that uh, they prescribe to uh, cannabis to the veterans that need it. Before we get there, I think we need to find out what is cannabis good for and what is cannabis not good for. And that takes research. And sadly, we don't have the research. Again, because of our false uh, war on drugs, so to speak, we should have been putting people in hospitals and rehabilitation centers instead of prisons for drug offenses, but that's another story. Focusing on the issue at hand here today, uh, my legislation, uh, and I've been working on it for four years now, is essentially targeting the VA, asking the VA to do research into what cannabis, how it can affect veterans, what it's good for and what it's not good for, and then letting us know, report back to us, the legislature, 
your findings within a certain timeline because it's one thing to pass a law and say, Mr. VA, Mrs. VA, do the research, and then they go off into oblivion and don't come back. We know the VA has a bureaucracy that is essentially stacked against, stacked and predisposed to not address cannabis. And so what we need to do is need to force them into administering, into advocating for good public policy based on research. And that's what my legislation does. Where does it stand? I think we have a good shot. We will have a good shot. Uh, the Moore Act, which is Jerry Nadler's bill that you know essentially legalizes cannabis, will pass Congress in the next few days as in the lame duck session. The challenge is going to be, how do we get this legislation through the Senate? And we don't know how to do that yet because we don't know whether it's Democrats or Republicans that will control the Senate. Now, with that being said, if it's a democratically controlled Senate, we are still not sure that we can move legislation through the Senate that's cannabis space. But we know uh, Senator McConnell, Majority Leader McConnell, has said he's not interested in this issue. Uh, and so um, it's going to take, it, it's gonna take uh, some work to get legislation through the Senate. Uh, another alternative is to look at the presidency and see what the new president-elect Biden can do through executive order. Uh, I think that's the surest way to uh, address the issue of cannabis. Uh, as you all recall, we used to have the coal memo under the Obama administration, and the coal memo essentially said that the, wherever there's a state uh, regulatory process, that is viable and effective, then federal law would not be enforced in that state, meaning state law would prevail. I think that's the very, the very least we can expect from the Biden administration, which is the resuscitation, the re-implementation of a coal memo. But we want to push the envelope because uh, according to some surveys, something like 70, 80, 90 percent of veterans uh, support medicinal use of cannabis. I translate into that into uh, saying that the vast majority of veterans are probably using or have used medical cannabis. And so to me, it's, it's important that we move forward, that we find out what cannabis is about and what it's not about, what is it good for and what is it not good for, so that we can have that information to provide our veterans as we move to fulfill our moral promise, which is you go off and fight for a country, you sacrifice, now that you come back to society, we're gonna take care of you. And I'm not gonna lecture to veterans as to what's good or bad for them. I'm going to listen to veterans and then implement public policy based on what they think is good policy for them. Thank you very much, over. Thank you so much, Congressman Correa, um, for being here with us today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I think now we, um, if I'm correct, Dustin, we are going to move back to our panel on barriers to access. Um, and we are going to move on to Army veteran Jose Bellin, who is the CEO of Florida Mission Zero Inc., a nonprofit dedicated to combating PTSD and preventing veteran suicide that. Um, so thank you uh, for um, having me here today and for all of us uh, together. Um, I'll make this very, um, you know, short and sweet in a way. I'm, I'm a combat veteran. I was part of the initial push into Iraq in the spring of 2003 with the 1st Armored Division um, Field Artillery Veteran, and our orders were very clear to uh, secure Baghdad, um, and with that also look for Saddam Hussein. Uh, we were there for 14 consecutive months, um, served with the 1st Armored Division, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Field Artillery Regiment out of Gießen, Germany. Uh, got to Iraq when I was 20. I turned 21 and 22 while there. Um, needless to say, as a field artillery veteran, um, the work that we do is, is clear. It's combat arms, and we had a lot of exposure to um, close quarters combat, and with that, you see a lot of horrible things. Um, part of the issue that veterans have when we come home from service is the, the war continues for us here in our minds. Um, witnessing a, a child die in front of me, um, seven-year-old girl, 
was one of the most traumatic uh, moments of my life. Um, myself and two other soldiers uh, closed her eyes and had that time. And that's an image that uh, nearly led me to take my life a few years back. Fortunately, we're losing over 8,000 veterans a year to suicide. Number 22 a day is, is constantly associated with that because it's, um, it's hard to imagine, but every 65 to 72 minutes, there is a veteran in America committing suicide, and I was nearly one of them. And the reason is because for us is the transition barrier. There's an issue, you know, when we get out of service, we don't talk about the things that we've seen, number one, number two, um, it's, it's hard for us to accept a diagnosis saying that, hey, you have PTSD and you will be limited socially, um, you'll be limited professionally, and you'll have all these issues. When we join service, we have a, a vision of be all you can be in the Army, per se. But what about when you get out? Be all you can be when you get out. And a lot of us you know, come home with the invisible wound, PTSD, and don't know what to do with it because at the end of the day, we're given a set of medications from the VA to treat these um, nightmares and these issues with severe PTSD, uh, severe anxiety that just doesn't work for us. I myself um, am no longer ashamed to say I have PTSD and it doesn't have me. And that's the driver there. Veterans need to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I am not defined by my diagnosis. I am not defined um, you know, by what society is going to label me as. I'm not you know, mentally ill, I'm mentally strong. And so having access to cannabis immediately upon transition is, is priority number one for us because beyond, you know, the transition is the reintegration into civilian life. What is that? You know, what do you do when you go to your nine to five, you know, in the middle of the day, you're triggered by something you saw or you heard and you are afraid to have your, you know, fellow colleagues or employer judge you you know, and, and have fear of you because you are a veteran with PTSD. Um, you know, so I stand, you know, to speak on behalf of the veterans that are currently out there, you know, thinking that they're not strong enough, you know, to have this conversation and be on this Zoom call as well. There's absolutely no reason that a, an American man or woman, a, a veteran who served honorably should be ending their life. And, and to know that the, the biggest roadblock that we have to compassionate access to a medicine that's been around for thousands of years is our very government. Uh, there's a, I'm here in Florida and there's a, a case going on that's absolutely just outrageous in Marion County. A United States Marine Corps combat veteran who served in, in Desert Storm, he was a, a, um, his name is Mike Hickman, a, a dean, a former high school dean, lost his job after 10 years because he's a legal cannabis patient. You know, they, the school board gave him a choice. Look, we'll let you have your job back if you promise to not use medical cannabis. And he said, absolutely not. So this man lost his job. That is absolutely beyond me. How is that possible? How do you, want, how do you turn to a man who served honorably and, and asked nothing of his country, who's come back and become a leader and say, hey, look, you know, choose be, be, between, you know, your, your employment and means of security or you know, figure out your life. And, and that's a, a decision that, you know, unfortunately took place here in Florida and it's happening across the country. So veterans right now to, to reduce the transition barrier, to get past the reintegration barrier, we need to find each other. Mission Zero, you know, I started, you know, along with my wife as, as a means to not only, you know, so, save veteran lives, it's a way to give veterans reasons, uh, uh, reasons to live again, excuse me. Um, you know, join your local, you know, veteran organizations. Uh, you know, I'm uh, along with Eric Stamper who's on here as well and a group of, you know, veterans. Uh, we're over 100 strong. Uh, we've uh, started the Veterans Action Council. Please look at that. And that's a, a way for us to continue, you know, to, to have that mindset. We have our six down range, but we need to have that same six here at home. And having access to cannabis is, is the way to get it done. And we have to use our, our voices we have to use um, our resources. And most importantly, you know, before I, I, I sign off, is, is look in the mirror and, and dig deep, you know, and find that person that put that right hand up, you know, and, and, and empowered, you know, you empowered yourself at one point. Find that empowerment again and empower yourself to push forward. Because the, the reason I'm still here today and I did not pull that trigger is that was when I was on that ledge, 
Absolutely, I love my wife. Absolutely, I love I love my kids, my family, my friends. I love them all. But you know what? I love my brothers and sisters. And knowing that there are brothers and sisters right now that are on that ledge, that if we can just you know grab them before it's too late, just like me, that's what we'll do. And that's what this group is all about. And uh, you know, ASA, you guys are to be commended for for this. Yes, it's Veterans Day uh, tomorrow. You know, but it, it shouldn't be Veterans Day once a year. And that's the biggest misconception. Veterans do not come home looking for discounts on mattresses, looking, you know, for, for anything other than understanding and peace. It's not a sob story. Giving us access to cannabis is giving us access to our rights. It's, it's allowing, it allowed me to get in contact with that person pre-combat because there's something that happens to, to a human being, especially, you know, combat arms or if you've been exposed to things. It's like a werewolf in, in, you know, in a full moon. It changes. When you're in war, you're a different person. And then you're supposed to come back here in a civilian world and just reintegrate with medications that are not working. That's not fair. It's not fair to the you know, generations past, present, and sure not you know, fair to the generations of the future. So thank you today you know, for your time, everyone. And you know, we got to fight together. Thank you so much, Jose, for sharing your experiences and also for bringing up Michael Hickman, um, which I think is a story that has caught you know, millions of people's attention uh, recently and is certainly um, worthy of mentioning. I think now we are going to move on to what companies and advocates can do to help veterans um, and increase safe access to cannabis. Um, and we are gonna start that panel off with um, Air Force veteran, Michael Krowitz, um, who you guys have seen earlier um, in today's webinar. So Michael, take it away. Thank you so much. I uh, wanna kinda uh, keep this loose. Uh, just wanted to talk to folks about kind of where we're at and uh, you know what we're doing uh, to try to um, increase access for vets, what our issues are as veterans. There's two subsets. I would break up uh, the, the, the groups of our, our asks and, and what we're working on into kind of two subsets. Uh, one would be the states and one would be uh, the national. And at the state level, um, you know, we're working on uh, things from a bunch of different perspectives. Actually, we've got uh, military veterans groups working on access to, to medicine, growing hemp, uh, looking at growing cannabis uh, as a medicine, as a uh, sort of a uh, therapeutic device in growing cannabis as a medicine. So you've got all these different irons in the fire. I'd say overall, the two biggest things that, that can be done to help uh, one would be to support our efforts at the state level to create access for uh, military veterans and uh, also based on low income. And, you know, it came up with the federal legislation a while back. There was a lot of misunderstanding about are we trying to do this veterans affairs bill in Congress to give the veterans something special? Why would we do that uh, here? You know, what, what is the, the deal? What's the deal with that? And if, if that was the deal, I, it would, I'd agree with them. But that, that isn't the deal. Veterans have medical care that we get from the VA hospital. Uh, and then we budget our life around that. Uh, that that uh, medical care is based on our need, based on our income, based on our veteran status. Um, and when we do get a benefit like that, we uh, not only cherish it, but in integrate it into our lives. So if we have to go out and then pay for cannabis, that puts us basically a lot of us with low income. So, uh, and I just wanna make it clear that every veteran I think I've ever spoken to on, on these issues has been really clear that um, the, the work that we're doing isn't just for veterans. You know, we, we're not trying to just get a good outcome for military vets. If we, as military vets, can somehow get in this process and help to move the ball down the field for everyone, uh, that, that's what we want to do. But there are certain issues that are actually veterans' issues. Um, and another one that seems to be sort of a nexus point here is just protecting the medical cannabis access laws. Um, as we get into regulated adult access, if you start looking at all cannabis through the regulated uh, program of, let's say, Alcohol Control Board, and uh, you, you're seeing a very great erosion of the medicinal programs. And uh, again, we need that program to integrate our care with the VA to use cannabis as a medicinal uh, 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 you know, 
part of, of our medicinal program, part of our treatment plan at the VA. Um, so anything that can be done to help us, we had a great uh, bill that we worked on in California, I think that can be looked at as a model. I give uh, kudos to uh, uh, Sean Kiernan and uh, uh, the Weed for Warriors, who put in a lot of time on that to uh, create a program that would allow for cannabis to be given out in these regulated programs so that we can actually have a low income access and, and military veteran access without having to pay the taxes on it and have to get a, you know, a, a, a grant to be able to hand out free cannabis. Um, and, and the, you know, uh, protecting the, uh, uh, you know, state law is a variety of different actions and I'll leave it up to your imagination how you can help with that. At the federal level, uh, you know, we're basically looking at, we, the, the, we have to reschedule cannabis to something below three, like Matt Zorn said, um, the, the uh, playing field is certainly such that uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, not, basically nothing that we can do. We can we can work on the margins. You know, we and, and that's what we've been working on. Uh, uh, what uh, Congressman Correa was talking about, trying to inst instigate research. There's absolutely no reason why the VA shouldn't have been doing research all along. Um, this is something that we've known about since 1996. I think it's important to understand the VA's perspective here. They get a lot of input on cannabis as a drug of abuse, and there's inflated numbers inside the VA system of people that are suffering from cannabis abuse syndrome simply because they took a drug test and the drug test showed positive for marijuana. There's a, a evidence that a lot of veterans are being cued that way and inflating the numbers. And then basically the VA is caught trying to figure out, you know, parse through the abuse statistics on cannabis, how it's being used as a medicine. Uh, we really haven't broken through that yet. Uh, and, and that's where we're at. That's what we need to, to, to have this conversation with the VA to be able to take this next step and, and really start looking at cannabis as a medicine representative of what's actually being used in the states. We've got some great programs. Uh, we've been working on making sure that uh, state medical cannabis access programs have been fit to purpose. So one of the things that we picked up was post-traumatic stress. We felt that was a really important one that was being neglected. Our work about 10 years and hundreds of vets in 26 states or more, uh, we turned it around from just one state, New Mexico and California that had post-traumatic stress as a qualifying condition to virtually every modern medical cannabis state now has post-traumatic stress as a qualifying condition. And we have all that evidence, not just of veterans, but of uh, you know many different types of trauma, sexual trauma, uh, uh, childhood trauma, uh, a lot of... Uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, tra stress in uh, first responders. You know, we have a lot of brethren out there. Military veterans have been just stepping up and saying, this is a veterans issue. We own it. Uh, and we're, we're proud to, to say that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not uh, infallible and uh, we do suffer. And, and I think that by leading that, we have been able to lead others, but that's where we're at. We need to change the, the uh, federal landscape. I, just before I hand it back, I just want to give a couple of thanks. You know, uh, Americans for Safe Access, I gave a speech years ago about how veterans want to lead this. We want to be in the trenches. We want to help as, as much as we can, as I described, but we don't want to be used as a uh, sort of a prop and that we require to be structurally involved as we move along. And as you can see in this day, and as you can see in, in, in what uh, Representative Korea said and just how ASA has structured this event, uh, they listen and they've done that. And we really are thankful to ASA and thankful to the entire medical cannabis community for working with us as veterans structurally, having us involved. And just before I take the, leave the mic, I wanna say, you know, before I talked about the Prop 215 and uh, that's the Proposition 215 in California that basically started the ball rolling on medical cannabis in the states in their modern cannabis programs. And Dr. Todd Micaria was our touchstone doctor. Uh, Dr. Tom O'Connell uh, was uh, working with him on the press and, and the documentation end. And Dennis Perone was the one who got it started, all three military veterans. So we've been structurally involved all along. And I really uh, want to thank Jose for bringing up the Veterans Action Council. Uh, any military veteran can uh, participate in this action council. You, we all have a voice. It's structured and set up to give equal voice to all military vets and all the military veteran service organizations, <clears throat> small or large, to be able to have an impact on cannabis, which has been kind of left out of the discussion. The major veteran service organizations sort of just push it aside politically in favor of, you know, being able to do their meet 
potatoes work, which is very, very important, uh, you know, supporting the, the veterans uh, community in Congress. So uh, really, thank you. Thank you for all this. And uh, I hand it back to you all. All right, thank you so, so much, Michael, for that. Next up, we have Army veteran Todd Larkin. Um, Sorry about that, guys. Um, next up, we have Army veteran Todd Larkin, who is the founder of Texoma Veterans Alliance, a nonprofit that is dedicated to educating veterans about the safe use of cannabis. Todd, you're on. Thank you, Ms. Abby. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, first off, I just want to thank Debbie, Reno, and, and everybody at ASA for doing this. Like everybody said, uh, it's, it's an honor to speak with such an awesome panel, but um, to be part of what ASA does is is amazing. Um, I'm a patient first, um, a, a business owner second for sure. And so, throughout my whole journey with this, um, being a veteran and uh, attending ASA events and um, just just seeing everything that they do is it's not only heartwarming, but it's truly what cannabis is about. It's about a community of people coming together for the betterment of others. And um, that's what veterans are, are a lot about as well. Um, but I just wanted to talk about what it's like being a business owner and what, I, uh, what we try to do as advocates through our business. Um, like I said a while ago, I'm an advocate first, but I believe that as business, uh, businesses, we're advocates as well. And you, we have to remember who we're serving. Uh, we're serving patients. Um, no state's gone... Uh, had a cannabis uh, without medical first. And so um, it's not always been a recreational market uh, outside of South Dakota now, I think. So, uh, you know, we have to remember that patients, what brought, uh, brought us that business and that opportunity to run our business. So we have to take care of them uh, first. We do a lot of things, um, but this is, you know, this is kind of our plan. Uh, this is what we do. So please take um, what you can and what you will, but we're in Oklahoma. Uh, it's very loose in Oklahoma as uh, patients and, uh, for, for businesses and patients, but um, patients are already lost in the wash, unfortunately. I've been uh, running for two years and we just got good quality uh, tinctures out a year ago. So it's unfortunate for a lot of patients. Um, but we work with our legislators a lot. We try to show them that we're business owners, uh, we're, we're veterans, and that uh, we're serving our communities, we're doing different things. And they see that you know, we are doing those good things and, and being veterans, and uh, they know how much money we bring to the budget of the state. So they listen to us. Make sure you're speaking to them. Be be very clear with them. Um, attend their events uh, or what you can of those things right now. But communicate with them. Find their email at the very least and invite them to your school. Um, we try to talk and have different uh, relationships with them. It's it's hard in, in in a state like ours because legislators weren't for it. This was initiative ballot, so we um, have to communicate that this is a legal business and and, and uh, kind of erase some of those negative thoughts that a lot of legislators have here. Um, so one of the things that we've done by working with them is, is we've tried with, uh, to work where we don't have to toss our expired product. And I say expired uh, because state standards, they want it gone in less than 90 days. And I know a lot of veterans who could probably take care of uh, cannabis after 90 days and be happy with that, especially on the budget that a lot of veterans are on. And uh, so we really tried to push that with them. Um, we haven't been very successful in communications with them on that, but um, I believe at some point we're gonna get some people in, in office that believe that this is a, a good industry and a very beneficial for, for the medical community at the very least. Um, the, the main thing that our shop is, is driven for is um, patients, advocacy, and education. We want to make sure that every person that comes into this shop is, um, is educated. They know what they're using. They know what they're taking home. Uh, they know how to use it and hopefully what is going to be successful uh, with what they're trying to treat. 
and we get a lot of a lot of veterans that come in and we I personally being a veteran I, I take them a little closer because I want to see that success that I had with cannabis um, but also it's important um, because uh, as with our veteran group we educate about the safety of cannabis so making sure veterans know what they're doing how they're using it they're not going to get that information from the VA, I know. And so we have to hold their hand at times. And that's important to a veteran. Trust me, I've been to a lot of dispensaries that don't want to give me education, um, just want to sell me a product and send me home. And that's fine uh, if I know what I'm doing, if I know what I'm using. But are somewhere and, and you guys have to um, have to help. And so I hope that there, if there's some business owners on listening or that will listen uh, later on that you, you'll see that um just with any pay, patient that comes in not just a veteran but uh, helping them as much as you possibly can and not just trying to sell them something that's going to be more beneficial uh, than, than the latter but we um we educate we uh, our veterans group we have uh, uh classes extraction classes uh, taste test nights uh, perfume information um to use cannabis and we we do that through the shop as well uh, we've started a podcast now with the current uh, uh pandemic and uh, just to try to educate more because that's what um I, we talked about it the whole time michael's mentioned it eric's mentioned it Todd's mentioned it. education and, and uh, erasing that stigma is, is the only way that we're ever gonna get more legalization we're gonna be able to research um, until we get those legislators to realize uh, you know, where we stand as business owners and patients, it's, it's always going to be this way. So, hate and, and talk and, and be proactive. Um, you know, we, we help, help, help different grow classes, uh, try to educate patients on simple things as far as germinating a seed to harvesting, curing, um, more education. It's been very beneficial. There's a lot of veterans who, who are on that fixed income. And being able to educate them on growing at home has been wonderful. I love hearing some of the Vietnam vets that come into our dispensary tell us that uh, you know, they partner for the first time and uh, we won't see you for a while. And that's great because I know that, that they're home and they're medicating on something that they know is 100%. Um, last, last thing I'll touch on is uh, we've... We've really reached out to a lot of veteran-owned businesses, uh, manufacturers, growers, really good local growers in Oklahoma that are veteran-owned. And so they're driven uh, to that true medical aspect and patient advocacy. So they, uh, they attend events with us. They'll go to Oklahoma City with us and, uh, and speak to legislators. They'll go to DC with us and speak to legislators. And um, we, uh, we build those partnerships as veterans, but that allows us to do some other things like uh, you know, bring in uh, some more discounts for veterans and allow uh, for cheaper products for vets. Trying to discount things and get those, uh, uh, take care of veterans is important to us. I've been there, I know what it's like to, um, to have two pennies to rub together and, and, and worry about what medicine you're gonna take and uh, take care of yourself. So uh, taking care of, of vets is, is, is important to us in the shop educating patients, it's, uh, it's just our priority. So uh, I hope, like I said, that you take that and, um, and hopefully run with it. And we see some patients uh, treated very well at your countries and uh, you make those, those relationships um, and build and, and uh, you do well. So, but uh, I'll wrap it up. Um, I just, a uh, happy Veterans Day to all you veterans. Um, don't forget that we're all out there. We've all been through this. The reach out to somebody if you need help. Uh, we're all here. Thank you again. Amy. Thank you so much for that, Todd. We really appreciate you being here. Um, next up, we're gonna have a couple of quick videos um, featuring some patient testimonials, and then we are going to get into our Q&A portion. Um, and please put your questions down below in the chat um, or in the Q&A function here on Zoom so we can get those answered um, from all of our great panelists who are gonna stick around for you. Okay, everyone, I think we are going to switch over to our Q&A portion now. Um, hopefully everybody has begun sticking some questions down in that chat box. Our panelists are going to stick around to answer your questions. 
Um, and they are also joined by Army Colonel Dr. Philip Blair, also a West Point graduate, who is the Chief Me uh, Medical Officer for Harvest 360. Um, and so to get us um, sort of started on the Q&A portion, I believe I saw Lindsay in the chat um, ask a question about veterans who are on pensions or who are lower income accessing these medical cannabis cards, um, which is a great point that some of those patient testimonials brought up as well. So for our panelists, you know, whoever would like to sort of take the lead on this, talk about you know, access when it comes to financials, especially for veterans who, who are on pensions um, or really limited income. Sure, I'll add Stanford Hero with VI-22. I'd be happy to start this off. First, thank you for the question. It's a profound, to say the least. Um, I think that's a mirror of what we just heard from We for Warriors in the, in the grand scheme of what it looks like. Um, the difficult part here we have is each state is unique and different with its own state policies, regulations, and programs. And so what's amazing, like We for Warriors, which is doing great things for veterans and gaining access to free and, and uh, reduced cannabis, unfortunately won't work here in Maryland. We're a medical state, so we don't have the, the luxury to offer programs or incentives to that regard. Uh, so. Part of that would be pushing um, our state legislators um, and fighting for law and reform of our cannabis policies within our own states. And that's where organizations like the ASA, Normal, and some really big heavy duty organizations can come into play and help out to this regard. They teach us how to advocate and fight for our own rights and to make those policies shift. And currently at the same time, I have to say, I used to be afraid, not afraid, I was embarrassed after my retirement of 23 years to go to a restaurant and ask for a discount on Veterans Day. Tomorrow, there's gonna to be plenty of discounts going around. At one time, I'd be, I was embarrassed to do that. And I don't know what happened, but when I got into the cannabis space and learned how to advocate, start fighting, I had no problem all going straight to the dispensaries and start asking directly for opportunities and benefits for employment for veterans, as well as incentives and discounts on their medicine. You can start that directly at your own dispensary. And, and I understand it's really tough to do those top up programs. Like if you have a, a military discount and you're also a senior and really that's all about individual dispensaries and their own programs. A lot of these are also uh, multi-state operators. So you may think that you're at an independent uh, dispensary but they could be run by a, a larger uh, organization. So some of those changes may have to come from very high levels. Um, so you know, working within your state, within the industry, um, and just going out and asking for them directly. I think really critical now, uh, Maryland, October 1st, we just passed the uh, Fakiza Raman Act, which is our version of the Compassion Care Program. So that's another, I think, wonderful opportunity for our, our veterans to figure out and try to approach the industry and how we can go about this. So this allows, for example, uh, patients with Medicaid and veterans that are in the VA medical health care program. I'll, I'll bracket that by saying we have lots of veterans that are not part of the VA health care program that are being left off of some of these compassion care programs. So we've got to be careful when we're reading and writing laws, if and then statements. Um, so engage in maybe a compassion care program and start working really it's writing bills and policy. And you know, that takes a long time. And so it, I think from a patient perspective, that's some way we can help reduce some of the costs. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. Any of our other okay. panelists want to weigh in on this question? I think I might, Abby, if you don't mind. Um, I think uh, there's so many different ways to approach this. We have some sort of pilot programs, if you will. Uh, uh, in Washington State, I know Patrick uh, Seaford with uh, 22 Too Many is uh, doing a couple of different programs where they uh, have uh, medical doctors come in uh, and do uh, recommendations for free and just you have to just sign up, uh, uh, you know, just working out uh, sort of compassionate programs like that where the industry can help pay for uh, you know, a doctor's day to come in and do, uh, and we also have that in Florida. We have that, uh, you know, help me out guys, but there's a, a handful of states where we have that kind of program already in a sort of prototype 
uh, uh, phase. Um, I think that um, really interesting is as we're getting regulated access and having cannabis products on the shelf with buy by dates and sell by dates, uh, we can work out you know work out uh, deals with the uh, industry to in a very organized way redistribute the uh, stuff that's you know getting close to its uh, sell by date uh, and redistribute that out to low income and to veterans as well so there's some creative stuff that you can do um, I think you know one of the things that we've tried to do and it, it's really hard uh, is deal with uh, women's veterans issues and uh, I think it's really a, a, a great privilege to have Teresa on the on the call. So I'm leaning on you a little bit here, Teresa. I hope you don't mind, but uh, it, we have you know kind of a lot of uh, you know general issues, uh, and uh, uh, Teresa has been working a little bit on the states and and also from the female perspective. I'm uh, hoping maybe you could give us a little bit of insight from that on uh, any particular issues to women vets uh, that that you found. Yeah, I can definitely do that, Michael. So what I'm hearing and seeing in the women's veteran community is that a lot of women veterans suffer from a lot of symptoms that men suffer from, i.e. back pain, um, PTSD, um, um, all the things that, you know, a lot of the men have disabilities for, women veterans have it likewise. Uh, I think the only difference is um, our treatment options are a little different um, and, and we can't put everybody in the same box. Um, I, I hear you and Eric talk about, you know, laws and regulations, but I think the important thing that we all need to recognize is the fact that there has to be awareness out in the community, even for women veterans. Um, I have a few of my female friends that haven't even thought about cannabis and they're, they're having a list of opioids that they take on a daily basis. And, and I, I think there has to be some sort of campaign or initiative where we have open con conversations about cannabis and its benefits. Um, I know one of the things that I would like to do in the future is to have a women's veterans roundtable where we get women veterans to sit and hear about um, how th this can be a treatment option for them. And no different than what I've done at AMVETS in my ROSE events, in my roundtable with women veterans. When we congregate together, we kind of lean on each other for solutions. And I believe if we do roundtables and bring more awareness in the veteran, women veteran space, women veteran will see this as an option. So I think it's important that we do awareness, we do education, um, because they call me, they think I know everything as, as a nurse and ask, you know, hey, Sharisa, what about cannabis for endometriosis? What about, um, you know, cannabis for, um, I have fibroids. Uh, I mean, and, and back pain and migraines. I'm like, of course, yes, yes, and yes. So it's, it's important that we bring that education to the community as well. So it's a lot we got to do, but I think if we bite off it, you know, by little chunks and, you know, let those advocates out here do things that they have expertise in as a nurse, you know, I know GYN issues very well, even though I'm retired, I actually still work in the gynecological community. And so I, I can talk and discuss these topics with women veterans and, and help them understand the importance of knowing that there are other options out here besides the typical drugs and opioids that their PCPs prescribe. So thank you, Michael, for, for bringing me on to that part. Thank you I so wonder much. if I could jump in. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm Dr. Philip Blair and um, retired colonel. I went to military academy, did family practice, taking care of families, and I was a combat um, uh, physician uh, in the first Gulf War. And I would mirror exactly what uh, Ms. Jackson is uh, saying in the uh, issues for women, having taken care of innumerable women veterans as well as family members. Uh, I find that the biggest problem is the lack of knowledge, not only on the individual patients, but also on the medical providers. They have been uh, misinformed, uh, and the science of endocannabinoid or cannabinoid science has been sorely neglected within our medical school curriculum, as well as in the training and continued training. And so one of my initiatives is to try to educate physicians uh, to represent a more conservative approach and a background and advocate for its use. I've had the opportunity to help uh, hundreds of veterans uh, using uh, cannabinoids, and uh, I look at it from a holistic uh, point of view 
and trying to get a complement and integrate within a, as a compra, comprehensive approach to their medical care problems. Women's issues are particularly susceptible uh, to uh, cannabinoids and major benefits. So uh, I appreciate exactly what uh, Ms. Jackson has to say on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair and Teresa. We really, really appreciate that. Dr. Blair, we actually have a question for you from the chat. Um, so folks wanna know to help understand how cannabis um, sort of drug on drug interactions with cannabis and typical medications prescribed for patients with PTSD and depression. Can you sort of expand on that a little bit, please? Well, most of our experience has come from the epileptic drug, uh, Epidiolex, and that is used in massive amounts. It's a pure uh, substance, and so it is uh, taking out all of the entourage and all, all of the other um, cannabinoids that go along with it, uh, as well as the terpenes and other valuable substances. The result is an increase in interactions, adverse interactions, and it requires a much, much higher dose 10 to 20 times what a normal dose for an individual would be. Now, when you get into those situations with massive doses, just like you would with taking too much Tylenol, then you can get interference in some of the ways that these substances are degraded. And so massive doses are associated with interactions and much more common. And in addition, uh, then you're also with these massive doses, then um, you're increasing the number of adverse effects and purified substances uh, like the cannabinoids that are, are being used, the artificial ones, tend to have uh, um, quite a number of adverse effects. So there's minimal interaction between uh, cannabinoids and the other medications at normal dosing uh, it, within the normal range for what we usually use cannabinoids for. It's only at very high levels would you run into that problem and that's typically with the pharmaceutical versions. Absolutely, and any of our other panelists wanna weigh in on, on this uh, drug drug interactions with cannabis and, and other medications uh, often seen with veterans? I would say as a nurse, one of the things we always tell our patients is you start slow. <laughs> and so um, it's important that when you do get your um, your medication, your, your cannabis prescription, that you know to follow the instructions, follow the guidelines that your bud tender or your provider gives you. But it's also important that you start slow. You don't know how your body's gonna respond, nor do you know how this particular medication is gonna to respond to other medications that you're taking. So there has to be an education piece where the patient knows the medication that they are currently taking, as well as how it's gonna be affected by cannabis. But again, start slow before you do anything. Um, you can reverse something that's a little, but you can't reverse um, medications that you take a large amount in. So that's what I always encourage patients to do. I, I have something to add, if you don't mind. Um, we, we started working on adding post-traumatic stress as a qualifying condition in Oregon. They had a package of different uh, psychiatric medical conditions that they were working with for many years to try to add. And uh, we looked at it uh, mostly from the perspective of uh, not drug-drug interactions so much as the uh, uh, reduction in drugs that we saw so consistently in with regard to pain, we saw a reduction in how many of the opiate pain pills they were using, as I said before, uh, when they use as an adjunct, but also we saw a sharp reduction in, in, uh, uh, in some of the need for some of the cocktails. I mean, the veterans were leaving and still leave the VA sometimes with large bags full of cocktails. Many of these drugs were used off label for post traumatic stress, and we see a, a marked reduction in those. Some of them, uh, like the post traumatic stress drugs that are approved, just a couple of them by the FDA carry suicide warning labels. So, you know, we're looking at a reduction in opiates. We would then therefore expect a reduction in overdose. We see a reduction in some of the drugs that may have a suicide 
uh, ideation problem, maybe we'll see a reduction in suicide. That's just our you know, layman's point of view looking at it. Uh, but then we looked at the science that was giving us some of the case studies from like New Mexico and, and California, and it was pretty good. What I mean by pretty good is we didn't see any horror stories with uh, cannabis at the doses that they were using it for in the dispensaries, using it for post-traumatic stress, you know, having any problems. So I, I think that was, you know, kind of the, the baseline. It was a good record and it's continued. Uh, we've been looking for a horror story. I'll give you, you know, for a second, Todd, but uh, I just want to add that we really butted heads a lot with the American Psychiatric Association, but time and time again, they brought hypothetical arguments against us based on what they expected from large patient populations, based on what they were learning from the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, not really the case studies. And we were very sensitive and are very sensitive to the vets and the other patients out there. And we have never had a clinic come and tell us, say, we stopped using cannabis because the side effects, the negative side effects were too bad. So I just want to, you know, knock on wood and <laughs> say thanks for that, Todd. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I would love to add about drug-drug interaction is one that we're completely forgetting, uh, and that is the most deadly drug on the planet, that is alcohol, right? And it's always uh, one of the main reasons, I would say, that I would get phone calls at about three in the morning uh, telling me to come pick a soldier up from, from the drunk tank or, or that there had been an accident. Right. One of the questions um, that I always ask veterans who have transitioned over to medical cannabis is like, what's your relationship with alcohol like now? And every one of them says, I drink so much less, uh, so much less. And, and I'm the same way. Right. I was a military uh, defense attache. Uh, for many years where I was being paid to drink alcohol. Uh, and, you know, it, and that's not really a great combination for someone who comes back with chronic pain or post-traumatic stress or issues sleeping. You, you end up using alcohol to get where you need to be. With cannabis, I find uh, that my alcohol consumption has reduced significantly. And that is a, a data point that that is kind of um, shined through with every other veteran conversation that I've had. Uh, I also wanted to mention that, you know, we, we've talked here already about a significant amount of, um, uh, you know, education as well as uh, need to continue this conversation. I believe this conversation is one of the most, most important conversations that we can be having in the United States today. We're talking about the use of medical cannabis. And, and I think that, you know, Focusing this into the veteran community is very important. Uh, I have said for a very long time that the veteran voice being so highly respected um, it is the voice that will break the back of prohibition, right? The history of our re-legalization in the United States started in California, really. And well, I guess we could say it started in 1970, as soon as the drug war began and the formation of normal, but really, Air Force veteran Dennis Perone, uh, as Michael pointed out, you know a bit of cannabis history. Dennis Perone and and Jack Herrer and and uh, uh, Eastman and all of these guys who really started this um, was based on you know what was happening, an epidemic that was happening in the United States and around the world, the the AIDS epidemic. And in California, my home state, I'm very proud of the fact that we pushed this through. Same year that I was leaving the academy, you know, the same year I threw my hat in the air, my home state legalized medical cannabis. I'm very proud of it. It's not the best medical cannabis program in the country. Now I live in Missouri where we do have the best medical cannabis program in the country. But, uh, you know, th this is start. This is started by, by veterans. It's for veterans. This conversation is important. And I think that we can implore uh, DOD officials and decision makers to engage with us in this conversation. We are asking for bold, courageous leadership, right? And, and for, for someone to, to really think critically and creatively about one of the most complex situations that we have, uh, you know, today in the country, and that's, that's veterans health. And that translates to the rest of the health of the United States, because we're really a cross section of that. Um, you know, so I, I would I would invite a conversation with the DOD and, and encourage them to spend some time on the line with us or in person with us. Right. Uh, I think, you know, Eric Stamper and I were speaking earlier today. There are a number of different places and different ways and, and hybrid methodologies that we could do this. But when we can bring veteran voice, voices to the table with a solution. Right. Everyone in here who served in uniform knows that you don't go to your commander with a problem. You go to your commander with the solution. I think that we can do that. Um, so 
that that's re- that's really where I wanted to get to. One of the things is, is that education too can all be consumed online. Uh, one of the messages that that I always tell general officers when I speak to them, flag officers or senior non-commissioned officers or even uh, our elected officials, is that you will not come up hot on a urinalysis by engaging in conversation about cannabis or reading a book or watching a documentary or or you know speaking with the, any one of us. You know, um, so I think education is a big part of that. A lot of that stuff is already made. Harvest 360 is now partnering with Green Flower Media, who makes really great, uh, you know, digestible content that we think would resonate uh, with, it is already resonating actually within federal organizations. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get past the point where the, the quality of our character is judged by the content of our urine. Uh, hopefully we can get to a point where we can uh, once again have access to the safest, most effective and cost effective medicine that, that we've ever had, um, you know, and one that we've had the longest relationship with. Uh, so, sorry, I know that's a lot and it probably wasn't really addressing any, any questions <laughs> specifically, but it's something that I really wanted to share um, and just say that I'm really proud to be a veteran and, and to be on, on screen with you all. Thank you so much, Todd. I, Dr. I know Blair. you guys are so passionate about it, and that's that's so exciting for the rest of us. Um, I do want to switch gears a little bit and ask you guys another question, um, especially for the folks who have a hard stop right around 6 p.m. today. Um, when it comes to veterans and employment, whether we're talking about uh, service members still on active duty or maybe veterans who are working um, in federal government jobs and things like that. Talk about educating them um, about how they cannot use cannabis or cannabinoid medications safely. Uh, Eric Stamper, VI-22 again. Indeed, uh, that's a really tough topic of choice to, to bring up. Obviously, the law is the law. Um, there is a zero zero tolerance in our uh, military services about drug abuse and usage. Um, if you're found to be under the consumption of cannabis, uh, they will process you out. Um, depending on the conditions and, and causes of that usage, there might be some mental health treatments, maybe some other addiction counseling that goes with it. But uh, the government, active duty military, has a zero tolerance. What we could do is look at countries like Canada, who just last year approved active duty usage of medical cannabis under like a, um, just like alcohol or any other type of activity that's permissible under, um, you know, their rules. So, you know, again, we could go back looking at the research that's already done and figure out how can we use that and just bring it back home. Um, One thought. I believe Dr. Blair had something he would like to add. Well, I wanted to talk about uh, we we think in terms of these uh, cannabis as a treatment for these illnesses as they come up uh, because of the health restoring properties. Cannabis could be used prophylactically for a number of the problems that we face as active duty soldiers, the threat of war, uh, the trauma that we are encountering. In fact, the evidence shows that using cannabinoids within six hours after a traumatic brain injury could be restorative and protective. The same thing happens for biologic injuries. So there's a, at least 16 different mechanisms where, where the cannabinoids could be protective against COVID. So these viral illnesses, these chemical and biological agents would be extraordinarily valuable if we can get DOD actively involved in this conversation and use this in place of the other drugs that have not been overall effective. Absolutely. And and I, I just have to speak out because, uh, you know, Dr. Blair really helped us uh, build concept a, around prophylaxis that cannabinoids they may be able to create. And we uh, came up with a, a project called the Athena Protocol, our strategy to mitigate and treat traumatic brain injury using non-impairing cannabinoids. Uh, when, when, you know, I first or saw that the U.S. government has patents on cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant, antioxidant, and an anti-inflammatory, uh, yet we were still not researching it. I was just appalled at, at our, you know, we're just blinded by this stigma um, and, and really lack, uh, you know, open thinking 
towards this. So, you know, our, our goal would be to maximize neuroprotection and neuroplasticity in a soldier in combat so that they could be prepared for the ischemic insult that comes with a, an IED. Um, and then be able to, once if, if a traumatic brain injury is suspected as part of buddy aid, as part of that chaos that goes with, uh, you know, securing the perimeter and returning fire and taking care of your wounded through buddy aid, we want to be able to administer more non-impairing cannabinoids so that we can begin that anti-inflammatory process of a traumatic brain injury uh, at the point of injury or as close to it as possible. Um, and, and it goes on, you know, our concept really goes on to, to include the use of full spectrum cannabis as an adjunct portion of physical therapy and talk therapy and job therapy and creating uh, purpose and, and the ability to, to, uh, to heal uh, and make it much more, much more possible. Sorry, I know that's a bit pie in the sky, but Michael, you had, you had a word or two? Well, if you don't mind, yeah, I, I uh, weigh in a little bit on a couple of fronts. One, we actually did have an experience. We had a dialogue with the active duty military once. Uh, there was a couple of different veterans we wound up interceding on with our one-on-one -on -one patient advocacy, especially that we did years ago um, that led up to the VA policy. Um, one was in Washington State and one was in Colorado. They were both veterans that were being out-processed from the military. They were taking so long to out-process them from the military that they wound up participating in the state medical marijuana programs that they were near, nearby living around and then got ensnared in drug testing on base. And we looked at the Uniform Code of Military Justice and we found some wiggle room, actually. We talked to both commanders and they were both very, very willing to enter in a dialogue with us and talk to us and, and apply that wiggle room if, if, if possible in those cases. Uh, didn't help in both cases, uh, but that was for other reasons. And the wiggle room was just this. A commander can look at a drug test as a false positive if they feel that there's some good reason to call it a false positive. And participating in a state medical marijuana program, uh, they thought, was uh, such a thing. So it's, it's a little tiny bit of, of wiggle room that an active duty troop might be able to find. Uh, but we look forward to the day where they have you know, uh, sort of an auto ejector right on the battlefield that would help with traumatic brain injury, for example. We have great imagination based on the cannabinoid research that we've got going on now. And just to finish it up on the state level, when you put into state laws that you're passing, infrastructure to protect jobs, that's what we need, not just for vets, but for everybody. And uh, veterans that have lost their job or, or lost the funding or lost a, a loan or something like that because of a stigma, we've actually been able to fight those on a case by case, case basis pretty well. You know, so I don't know, others might have other experiences, but Teresa, you're, I think next. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off what um, Dr. Blair said. Um, I think it's important. One of the things that I, I always quote for veterans that's coming to our HEAL program and particularly for those um, who are suffering from suicidal ideation and everything we hear about suicide intervention. I, I, I always quote this, this formula that I have. As a nurse, we have formulas, right? And so my formula is early detection plus early intervention save lives. So if we know that veterans are suffering and, and a veteran comes to us early and tell us, hey, I'm suffering. If we do early intervention, we can intervene early we have more of an ability to save their lives instead of waiting until they're 10 out of 10 in order to try and save their lives. So I just wanted to, to um, interject that, that that is something I think we can use in the cannabis space, um, whether it's on the DOD side or here in the veteran community, early detection plus early intervention saves lives. Thank you so much for that, guys. One uh, other question sort of on the medical end of things we had in the chat was understanding how cannabis works in supporting treatment of PTSD and depression. Um, as a reporter, that's the question that I get uh, most often from my veteran readers and listeners is how exactly it works to help treat those conditions. Um, and specifically in the chat, we had a question about how cannabis uh, changes through 5-HT1A Halfway. Do you want that answer in within three minutes, or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a, a comprehensive program? The, the effects are Come on. vast and, and integrated <laughs> in the ways that uh, the cannabinoids help uh, in PTSD because PTSD is a complex of it's a. Uh, uh, and we haven't in, entirely determined exactly what it is, 
But the cannabis actually addresses almost all of those issues, including the brain dysfunction and the, and the decrease and in inflammation that is going on in the brain, as well as a number of the memory pathways that are distorted, including the cortisol and the, uh, uh, the, the endocrine uh, engagement that goes, goes along with it. So what the cannabinoids do, do is that it restore normal to the brain function and activity, and they allow the normal operation about suppression of these uh, emotional memories in a pathologic way and bring them back to normal. So in, in fundamentally, it's addressing uh, a dozen different receptor systems and a, do a dozen different mechanisms uh, that are involved with PTSD, and they're all for the benefit. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Blair, I know we've talked a couple of times regarding what the physical manifestation of post-traumatic stress looks like in the brain, and, and that could include kind of calcification around the base of the dendron and neuron that keep us stuck in on, or that, you know, the kind of uh, hypervigilance that, that we see. Do you, do you think that perhaps some of the, um, you know, uh, some, some of the properties of cannabinoids might be able to decalcify or serve as an antioxidant, you know, as the, the U.S. government patent on CBD suggests? Well, there's a broad range of uh, effects. You'd certainly have the antioxidant effect uh, that's going on, decreasing inflammation. And there's also a leakage of the blood-brain barrier that allows for more of the toxins and irritants to get into the brain. But it's actually stimulating the neurons and the neuron formation and additional nerve connections, as well as the mitigating some of these hormonal effects for that cortisol that's pumping through our veins, and as well as the, the epinephrine uh, that is going along with those memories. It calms those things and normalizes those so we're don't, we don't get that uh, fight or flight phenomena. And we normalize our sleep, which is so important to resolve traumatic injuries. Yeah, it feels like for me, it just kind of makes me a nicer person. Uh, that's a, that's the layman's term of I think what you just described, and 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 uh, yeah, nicer person. That's what we want to be sometimes. Thank you guys so much. Um, so it is six o'clock, but we are going to stick around for a couple more questions. So if anybody has them, please drop them into chat here on Zoom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask our panelists a question. You know, sort of looking forward. What next? What now? Um, my proposal would be to engage with the Department of Defense directly to, to send an invitation. I would like to propose a, a, a cannabis leadership forum because I think that's the secret ingredient here, right? And it's something that we have a huge amount of within the activist community, within the business community, and within the military community. That's kind of where we all intersect is leadership. And, you know, if we could invite the Department of Defense and representatives of the VA to join us in a conversation over, you know, not two hours at the end of the day, but over a day where we can either join face-to-face uh, in some key locations, Eric spoke of the uh, VA research facility uh, in Maryland. I, I spoke about the, the potential for the Command and General Staff College being a centralized point to kind of carry this conversation and really talk about what the future could look like um, with medical cannabis and have that conversation and, and write stuff out on whiteboards and, and engage with people and talk about a strategy to to move towards a future, to define that future and move towards it. That's what we do here. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, maybe even a, a hybrid conversation where we have some in person, some um, virtual and, and have a, a, an, an, you know, a, um, an option, a course of action to follow from that. Right. Uh, I, I want to, I keep, I love finding the person that says we just can't do that. It's too hard. You know, we are the country that puts six flags on the moon, all right? We, we are the country that, that, that came in and won two world wars or, you know, contributed with allies and partners and friends. We, we are the country that can do great things. And I think that, you know, after the most recent four years of, 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 of interesting times and, and, and uh, you know, a unique style of leadership, um, I think that we're perhaps on a path to where, maybe where we can approach that. 
you know, we kind of have the conditions at this inflection point that I spoke of, as well as this, uh, uh, you know, as, a, as well as this kind of paradigm shift and relegalization of cannabis. Uh, with and and that all wraps around this great purpose of of allowing veterans to uh, treat the ills that that come with service to the nation. So uh, that's I guess my my option is another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Michael um, and, and Eric probably have some much much more actionable items. No, I, uh, Todd, I think you've got it. But the truth is, take action at the federal level. Look, there's two things about this. Well, what we're trying to do locally is suicide prevention as well as descheduling. And so we need to know the fair difference between, and this is a long discussion of descheduling versus rescheduling and, and changing our um, course of action on that level. But um, so I think really some of the things we can do is again, work at the federal level, have the meeting that you discussed and uh, make the case. The case is being made across the, the nation. And we have to have a clear message that we all can jump on and that we don't deter from. You know, the veterans are at the tip of the spear when it comes to, in my opinion, how we're gonna go about legalization in America. Uh, when a veteran win, everybody wins. And so we have to keep the fight alive and keep it real. With this change in leadership now, there's no doubt going to be some transformations and instead of riding coattails, we have to be um, bulldozing through those barriers. Well, I guess yeah, leaders. I can weigh in next. Um, you know, the the future is is really in, intriguing to me <laughs> right now. Uh, the, what's going on is is kind of amazing on on a whole bunch of different fronts. Um, I think that um, you know we have an opportunity that's you know, gonna open up before us that's sort of multi-dimensional. Um, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access is a little organization that I took over from Marty uh, you know, back around when we created the, 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 the impetus for the VA medical marijuana policy back in 2007, 2008. And uh, it's a voluntary organization. It basically doesn't exist other than you hearing it from me. You know, we're very transparent to the point of invisible, I tell people. Uh, but we support a lot of things and we work on a lot of things behind the scenes like working with ASA on projects like this. And uh, this is you know, a quick rundown of what we've got involved in right now. We're working with, uh, in California, a, a pilot project that was created by Prop 64 to create cannab the first cannabis appellation. And cannabis appellations, in short, uh, I'll let you look it up and do some research, but just a 30 second version is that uh, cannabis appellations to me represents a way to both preserve heritage, history, indigenous use, traditional use, and the knowledge base and the genetics, but also creates a path to market and can help with the first steps of, of creating a pathway to the pharmacy for these products that are available in the dispensary, but don't seem to be available to Dr. Sicily for a study, right? Uh, and, and then uh, the other thing we're involved with is this state to state pact stuff that we're involved with. It started with a law that we got passed in Oregon to create uh, the first state that allows for interstate commerce of cannabis. Uh, and, uh, and all this is towards the end of working on federal law that will be encompassing and, and, uh, and open to these types of things to allow for this commerce of cannabis for the end result of being good, high quality cannabis products for medicine available to patients at a lower price with greater availability, more genetic diversity, being able to hit a lot more buttons uh, to help a lot more patients. And, and uh, what we found ourselves embroiled in now is working internationally because of the international component that Matt Zorn talked about of our uh, national law. Uh, we got a vote coming up next month in December in the United Nations in Vienna, Austria on recommendations that came over from Geneva, Switzerland from the World Health Organization that could change everything for cannabis worldwide. And uh, even if it doesn't change everything, it changes underfoot. Uh, and that federal government thing, I'll leave you with this, we have a choice and it's something we found ourselves in the mix of. I, you know, It has to do with this kind of thing about veterans not just stopping at where it helps us, but figuring out what went wrong and trying to fix it. And uh, the international treaty stuff is not just a thing that could stop us or slow us down from doing something nationally, which is kind of our perspective. And the MORE Act that was talked about earlier is a piece of legislation that will work. It will work. There's no legal problem with it working, but what it does is ignores the treaty 
completely. And the treaty function in the Controlled Substances Act that Matt Zorn talked about will still be there. It just won't apply to cannabis, but nobody will really know that because it's just very cryptic legal stuff. So we have this question before us, do we want to legalize cannabis to create adult regulated access to finally get over the hump of you know, creating national medicinal cannabis access? Do we want to do that as an island? You know, just saying, you know, F you to the rest of the world. Um, sorry, you know, for the, the reference, but in here, you just have to say that because the rest of the world is looking at the United States as not just the cheerleader, but the thug that's been pushing this war on drugs into the, the world audience for decades, decades and decades. And uh, we think as veterans that we owe a debt of uh, gratitude for the World Health Organization for these great recommendations. Uh, and we owe a debt, a, a, a sorrowful debt to the world for imposing this drug war on the world. And, and as we think about marijuana at the national level, we should think about that. We should think about how the language of a, of a potential law that could be passed at the national level. Sorry. You guys oh, yeah, and Michael, you. I wanna, couldn't, uh, Sorry, can I, I just interrupt. want to congratulate you for looking at that international. No, it's okay. Um, I'm going to interrupt you guys just for a second and we can get back to this. Um, but we had a question specifically for Dr. Blair that I wanted to ask him um, about um, testimony that just played uh, about Marinol uh, being so frequently prescribed in the pain clinic at Walter Reed. Um, and Tamara says that a doctor told her um, that she, that the doctor thought uh, Marinol was the number one prescribed uh, drug in the clinic. I lost my microphone. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay? Good. Okay. Uh, so I don't have any experience really with the VA in terms of what is being used in the VA and Marinol, but I can tell you that satisfaction with Marinol and all of the artificial cannabinoids has been very seldom and with a large number of side effects. And so although it may be prescribed frequently, it is not a favorite and it's not tolerated in most patients. So it is, uh, it's a little bit like getting your cannabis from Mississippi uh, and the, the, the quality is just not there and you don't get the same results as you get from the modern uh, derivation and uh, organic growth and full spectrum that you get from a high quality product. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair. Um, and we had a question that I think Eric has an answer for um, with social distancing restrictions through the holidays, um, which is you know, really contributing potentially to people's um, mental health struggles. How are you connecting with veterans and how has that changed the way you plan to interact and connect with veterans this holiday season? Lindsay, thank you for the question, it's great. Um, it's important to know that a lot of us should and maintain mental health uh, with our healthcare providers, either through the VA directly, or if you're afraid of the VA, go through the VA Mission Act and find a local doctor that is outside of the VA program. Um, so some of the ways that we found it very engaging is, and I'm sorry, Jose Bellin left uh, a little bit earlier, but uh, every week, for example, we have a virtual veteran chat. Um, this isn't just a cannabis chat. This is a veteran check-in, a buddy check for all of us, if, for anybody who wants to attend. Any veteran is welcome to attend. We, we, we put it out there. And it's for us to go around the room, talk about some of the issues we're currently feeling, some of the, some of the problems that we're facing. Um, and really, it's about veterans taking care of veterans. Um, you know, if you go to the VA, a lot of your doctors and, and, and nurses, they're veterans as well but they're coming from a different arena. They're coming from a, a, a rule-based policy. So when veterans are allowed to communicate amongst themselves in these open forums and chats and groups, um, I think that's where we can start finding some of our answers and helping each other. I, we break down, you know, we're men. We break down and cry in these groups. And, you know, it's a way for us to understand we have a special language and it's just allowing us to communicate directly with each other. So for, for Lindsay, for those folks that are coming up on the holidays, we're already here, uh, who might be struggling, uh, reach out. Um, reach out to your friends, reach out to your family, your loved ones, reach out to your fellow veterans. Um, and we're, we're there weekly. We're, I think we're in about 28, 29 weeks of uh, Jose's program. So it's, that's just one of many 
avenues for us. <clears throat> and don't forget, you know, it's not just about cannabis, it's about veterans relating and, and healthcare. Go to the VFW, go to the American Legion. They all have, um, you know, staff that's on board. They all have uh, religious services that can help if, if that's your, your need. Um, and they all have counselors too. So stay engaged in mental health treatment and stay engaged with your veterans. That's kind of the way I feel. Thank you so much, Eric. And anybody else who wants to add to what Eric had to say or continue our discussion about looking forward um, and what's next? Well, looking forward to what's next is uh, I'm deeply looking deeply at the research that is going on in terms of the basic science and exploring this endocannabinoid system and as a part of this comprehensive uh, program, not only with those products that come from cannabis, but also uh, some of the derivatives that come from our own bodies and what we produce. The, there's an enormous amount of literature that connects for these things, and many of them are available right now at Amazon, for example, in terms of uh, the uh, different uh, food supplements that are there. And, we're, and understanding how these work. In addition, there are terpenes that are easily available, and they don't have any, uh, any limitation. They're generally approved, and they, they don't and some of the best uh, terpenes that we incorporate in our diet uh, have therapeutic values for a lot of the medical problems that we face. For instance, uh, caryophyllin, beta caryophyllin that's found in uh, things like black pepper. These are extraordinarily valuable for traumatic brain injury and for diabetes, and, and they could be incorporated, but it takes a certain amount of wisdom and education and acceptance for those. So uh, what's going to be happening in uh, the near future is an explosion of research into the endocannabinoid and cannabinoid systems that is actually separate and distinct from cannabis. And I think you want to welcome this because it's going to give us a better understanding of the broad range of diseases and conditions that we're facing. So we should embrace that. We should educate our providers uh, to endorse that and participate in some of the reading uh, and the retraining, as I've had to do is retraining all of my medical information on the basis of this key and fundamental system within the body. Thank you, Dr. Blair. Anybody else? Thank you. Yeah, that's always tough to follow Dr. Blair. He's one of the many superheroes that, that I surround myself by uh, as much as possible. I try to surround myself by genius, and it's been uh, it's wonderful to see so many on the screen. Um, I, I do think our future is bright. I do think that we are on to something big. Um, this, this is the potential for a revolution in medical affairs. Um, and, you know, I believe that we have set the conditions to really explore that. Um, you know, either in, in certain local areas, you know, we have 37 Petri dishes to, to work from, right? 37 different states that have different medical cannabis policies and rules and procedures and products and this and that. So we can choose the best of the best. Uh, you know, I, I, I currently feel like I'm in the, in the best spot. And, and this includes, you know, major access to medical cannabis, huge veteran population, uh, great relationship with academia uh, as well as the VA system locally. So I, I feel like we've set the conditions to allow the Department of Defense to kind of tip, dip their toe into this. If they're, if they're again, you know, willing to be uh, bold, courageous leaders who are creative and listen to us and listen to science and, um, you know, uh, be visionary about what the future could hold and how we could increase the survivability of soldiers in combat and increase the, the ability for veterans and their families to thrive after service. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it with that and say I'm very grateful to have been included on this. And thanks uh, uh, to ASA for putting it together. I'm going to jump in with one more question, and then I'm going to hand it off to Debbie for our final closing remarks. The last question comes from Michael Harvey, um, and he asks, there's been concern regarding cannabinoids being added to so many potential foods. Um, at what point do we need to worry about this causing a downregulation of our cannabinoid receptors? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. As it turns out is that uh, there are certain of the cannabinoids uh, that do downregulate the system, but uh, others do not 
uh, downregulate. And what we see is that THC has a tendency to downregulate, and that uh, provides for a certain amount of tolerance that we get with THC. On the other hand, the cannabidiol portion does not cause uh, a tolerance issue, um, and it uh, does not uh, downregulate. In fact, what we see over time is the dosage of uh, cannabidiol actually uh, decreases for, for a decreased need because you have, you have upregulated the endocannabinoid system to a balance. But there is that concern. I think the biggest concern that we encounter is a quality of product. And that's why we need legislation. We need rules and, um, and coordination of the products that are being made available so we get quality products that can be used and we can expect to have the responses from a clinical standpoint that we would like to see. I get it. it's on that if you mind, Abby. Um, you know, the, the, uh, what the future that we'd like to see, obviously, as if you can parse from we, what we said, we'd like to see cannabis normalized as a medicine and be available in the pharmacy at the VA, just like everything else. Um, until we get there, uh, we'd certainly like more help from the VA. We haven't had a lot of help from the VA. We'd, we'd like to see more. Uh, you know, they can't fill out the forms to, to, you know, do the recommendation. Maybe they could do something else. And I think at this point, uh, you know, we, we had this opiate commission that the president had formed a couple years back. And it was a big deal. And, and as I understand it, one of the record number of comments they got from the public was look into cannabis, look at what cannabis can do. Because it just was a study that had come out about Medicare uh, numbers, you know, indicating that people were using less of the opiates when they were using cannabis. Again, it wasn't rocket science. And uh, they didn't even mention it. And that's the disconnect. And I think that you know, goes to what Dr. Blair was saying too. You know, that's the disconnect that we need to, to solve and bring the knowledge base that we have already about cannabis and bring it into the mainstream and, and work with it and go with it. And uh, uh, certainly, you know, the VA should be entering into to studies and stuff like that. Um, you know, we, we just want to see the, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole thing, you know, integrated and, and, uh, uh, We'll do what we can, uh, in, you know, to get there. Thank you so much, Absolutely. Michael. And thank you to all of you. Abby, guys. Oh, did you have another? Okay. Yes, please go ahead, please. I'm, I, I, I am so, I am so sorry because I feel like we all want to continue to talk, um, and and especially me. And I'm sorry, I've got a lot to say on the subject, and I know every one of you do, and we're all so passionate about it. I do. I, I shared something in in the um, in the chat box there just to let everyone know that you know we are going to continue this conversation on on thursday night dr blair will be joining me along with the former tag of the kansas national guard as well as the only living uh congressional medal of honor winner in the state of missouri and we are talking about nothing but cannabis uh and and so if if you'd like to join us i think it's going to be a really uh, interesting conversation and, and, and an important moment, uh, and, and you also get an opportunity to listen once again to Dr. Blair, who's amazing. So, thank you. That's fantastic, Todd. Thank you so much for plugging that. Um, I may sneak in there too, if it's okay with you guys. Um, and so, I, I want to open it up to anybody else uh, from our panelists who have not had a chance to answer a question yet, or have some final thoughts that they want to share before I throw it to Debbie to close us out. All right, seeing none, Debbie. Michael, I, to... <laughs> no. I just want to say thank you guys so much. I mean, this has been the most amazing um, presentation. Um, it's really fired me up. Like we need to do more of this for sure. Veteran issue is such an important issue to me. My husband is a veteran. And so I, I really want to continue this. So we will definitely do this again. I want to thank all the speakers here today, um, all the veterans, Dr. Blair, Matt Zorn, um, and especially Abby for, um, for <laughs> moderating. Thank you so much. Um, and especially Rep, uh, Representative Carrera for speaking as well. Um, I want to thank our partner organizations, Veterans Initiative 22, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access, Mission Zero, uh, Texoma Veteran Alliance, and Harvest 360, 
Uh, we all work together to put this event on. I want to give a shout out to Dustin, Jeffrey, and Renal from ASA National for, for also helping to put this on, and they've been working a lot behind the scenes. Um, and I want a big, a big shout out to our sponsors at We Maps and Ease who continue to support our work. And both of them reached out to us when they found out we were doing a veteran um, event because they specifically wanted to help support veterans. So I really appreciate that. Thank you guys so much and we will be in touch. And don't forget, this is gonna be on our website um, probably Thursday or Friday. So anyone who missed it can watch it um, on our website. So thanks again. Bye guys. Very cool. Thank